guess I would just start by saying that this has been um, a great learning process. It started kind of with uh, the idea. It started with a strategy in the Sentinel landscape, recognizing the cultural richness of the geography in which we, we work in the Sentinel landscape program. So in and around Camp Ripley, very rich. We knew that in a general sense, but we didn't have all the data in one place. Data was disparate. It was in multiple locations, both on the state agency side and on local historians and tribal sides. Lots of information, really great information, just not synthesized and easy to access. The Camp Ripley Sentinel landscape wanted to protect those cultural resources and use cultural resources as a strategy for protection um, so that those resources wouldn't be um, destroyed or altered in any way, shape, or form and protecting those lands would be comp a compatible use with the mission and training mission of Camp Ripley itself. So we saw that as a win-win, multiple benefits of focusing on that. This grant through the Minnesota Historical Society was the first opportunity that we could articulate implementation of that strategy, the cultural resources strategy. And so it's exciting to kind of see it come to to be here we are in the final steps. We divided the project into sort of three steps, a 50% complete step, a 75% complete step, and a 100% complete step. We are now at 100% complete. We, for all intensive purposes, have completed our geo database. We have completed all of our research in the field. We've added all the pieces that we needed to add. And now we're sort of in the, 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 the big dance going around and giving presentations to everyone we can. We're, and we're really doing that for two reasons. One of them is we want people to see the data and what you can do with this data. But the other piece is really a thank you. Um, this project would not have been possible without all of the individual efforts or archival repositories or individuals with their expert content knowledge if they hadn't been willing to share with us, we would have never been able to make the geodatabase. Expectations at the beginning were mostly to, within the area we have, the 800,000 acres, um, getting as many of the recorded and like known sites. In the beginning, I categorized it. We have known cultural resources and unknown cultural resources. And the known cultural resources were all of the things inventoried with the State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO and archaeological sites recorded with the Office of the State Archaeologist. Because there can be archaeological sites that are not recorded with the State Archaeologist, uh, and they can be known by private entities, and if they're on private land, they don't need to be formally recorded, things like that. So these are the ones that we, as professionals, can know about, and the state agencies know about them. The unknown categories we were chasing up after that were um, what Fred Sutherland and Jeremy Jackson mostly worked on, which was what we called our cultural resource potential category. I knew we were going to find lots of great data, lots of interesting stories, diverse perspectives of what we could have. I, I knew there was a lot of material in the historical societies and in the Burke collection. My biggest concern is really, can we get through all of it and find everything we're looking for? That said, I've been pretty pleased along the way with what we have discovered. What's the line in the sand? How far can we go with our research? And we could continue on probably. Maybe there's more sites or structures, but I think we hit it really, really good. I think we found things we didn't expect to find. And um, I don't know if there's a lot more that we haven't investigated. Step one was just gathering all the data that we could find. This was certainly the most uh, enjoyable step I know for Fred and Jeremy Jackson. Uh, they had the opportunity to go to places like St. Cloud State to go see the Doug Burke archives, which was, by the way, where the first places actually let us in during COVID, which was one of our big challenges for this project, uh, getting access to data. So we couldn't get into places for the first few months um, and actually go and physically look at collections. So. How we overcame that is there's really good directors and volunteers at the historical societies that helped us get what we needed. If I needed something from Crowing County Historical Society or Cass County or Morrison County, it was very quick that they would get back to you. Um, the Burke Collection, I was already familiar with it. Plus, um, you know, Rob Mann up there, he, he made sure I had access to what we needed. We were able to visit that site during the pandemic uh, very early on. Uh, so that was... That was very good. They were able to do that right at the front end because we couldn't get into the historical societies at that time. I would say the bigger challenges that we had were 
trying to make sure we were all communicating and understanding each other over distances, especially over this winter as uh, COVID kind of limited our access and interactions with each other. Everything had to be done a lot more remotely than I would have liked. And so we needed to collaborate and coordinate, but we had to almost always do it in somewhat of a remote way. For me, I was surprised that there were as many eligible archaeological site leads still out there that hadn't been fully investigated. So at the beginning of the project, I figured, well, we maybe would get a couple things that would be interesting to put on what's called an archaeology alpha site form or an archaeological site lead form. We had four incredibly strong ones that I helped draft and submit and were accepted by the state archaeologist. But in addition to that, between Jeremy Jackson, Jeremy Ninow, and I, we've, we've talked through and vetted at least another dozen more. That was an impressive find that we could find up to maybe 16 potential really good archaeological site leads. Admittedly, I'm not an archaeologist and I'm not a historian, so I honestly didn't really know or have expertise to know what to expect. Um, but to me, some of the um, things that popped up in the process was this whole notion of how many schools and other communities and things, things that are important to, to historians and archaeologists that wouldn't have occurred to me as someone that's involved in the, in the field of natural resources or conservation work. So I definitely learned a lot of things along the way. Um, you know, I'm shocked by how many sites and structures we located. For example, the schoolhouse, um, the, the one-room schoolhouses throughout the landscape was a surprise, something I hadn't considered going into this. And I uh, breached it early with Jeremy and Fred. I was like, yeah, we, we absolutely have to map these sites. And there's, of course, dozens and dozens of those throughout Morrison, Cass, Crow Wing, uh, and, uh, and Todd County. This was out of, out of my channel, and uh, so it was exciting to learn about all the other things that were, were great discoveries. And I think some of that came from uh, Doug Burke's records and others where nobody had had an opportunity, there hadn't been a grant to focus energy on this geography before, and now all of a sudden we could through this grant. Being able to just drive, get out, and see places. I know that Jeremy Jackson spent probably his entire life thinking about these places up in his own backyard, working with people that are now dead, people like Doug Burke and others, been telling him stories about fur trade sites or railroads and, and things like that. And this has given him, for the first time ever, a really a stage to present all of that data. And I know it was, it was huge for him. And Fred jumped right in with him. You know, so they were able to, to get out there, make those contacts, um, go into people's backyards, make every stop, stop in every little town, right, and see everything that was available. And that was majorly their work. And that was finding all of the sites that could have subsurface archaeological potential. Um, they could be considered an important place, whether or not they might have material remains there. They could be considered important, uh, like a hilltop with an important view that we don't want to disturb. Um, not everything has to have an actual archaeological component under the earth to be important. Uh, so they, they chose to all of those sorts of things, and uh, there were more than I expected. Uh, Fred and Jeremy were really in heaven, uh, being able to go and actually see places, talk to people, gather data, and then bring that data back and, and show it to us on a regular basis. Uh, lots of times saying, oh, I can't believe we found this, and here, look, there's a ghost town, and there's map information about that. Um, and when we overlay that with other data we've been able to grab from other sources, whether it's initial GLO data or environmental data or rivers or modern uh, topo mapping, well, if we just adjust this map in a certain direction, it all lines up. And sort of those aha moments. It was great. Almost every day we'd have one of those. Everything that I worked on, uh, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years as a historian, I was able to tap into that previous emails or documents or what I've already done with historical societies and bring them into this. So for me, it was, uh, you couldn't do this without a local historian, but it wasn't just me. I mean, I, I had partnerships with, with people like Carl Faust, the historical societies, um, other individuals, friends of Crow Wing. You asked me generally about the things I was really excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, some of it was kind of just getting back to my old familiar things with the Iron Range. And then, I mean, I guess, 
Jeremy was always making sure you got it on camera, like me being excited as I could go around barrows and like, oh, that's this and this is that. And like, it's just one of those things where I'd kind of put aside that knowledge for four years or more. And, and now all of a sudden I get to get to dive into it again. It was kind of fun. The second part was really Laura's story in a lot of ways. So taking all the data that Fred and Jeremy Jackson had brought in and then giving it to Laura and starting to actually build it together in one geo database. It wasn't until I started seeing layer upon layer upon layer of data all in one place that I saw just how truly powerful this kind of device could be. For me, seeing the database at the end uh, with Laura's presentations, seeing how impressive the tool is, uh, is beyond my uh, understanding of what we were developing. It, it, it's very, very impressive. Uh, so this boundary we're looking at is the CRSL Project Boundary. Uh, it's created by a series of rivers, watersheds, township boundaries and things like that. And this is supposed to all be like uh, Jeremy was saying before, kind of like the donut around the donut hole of Camp Ripley here in the middle. So for this project, uh, Camp Ripley itself is not included. They have their own geo database that their GIS team uses. And this is all meant to be just strictly around the Camp Ripley reservation. So for your sake, being able to navigate, seeing where we are in the landscape, I'm going to pop in one of our reference layers. This is the satellite background image which will help some of you sort of figure out where you are in this landscape. Uh, we have Lake Mille Lacs over here. Uh, we have Gull Lake and a series of lakes up here. And I'll pop on another reference layer. We've got our cities and townships. So Brainerd, here we see Brainerd, East Gull Lake, Little Falls down here, Royalton. Um, you can also navigate by county. And here's how you can see a really specific county distribution. Morrison clearly takes up the majority of the area followed by Crow Wing and Cass, and lastly, Todd County over here, and even more specific breakdowns of township. Uh, so these are township borders. I have them all labeled so they overlap each other a little bit. I think seeing the maps was, was an eye-popping affair uh, where we could actually see the spots that, uh, as Jeremy described, were known. Uh, but then uh, staff, uh, Jeremy uh, and others, got into the Doug Burke records and others, and they found other sites. And so all of a sudden, the map was populated with even more than kind of the known sites. So when it comes to the layers that fill this in that we collected throughout the project, there are three different varieties of layers. We have the cultural, which is one that required the majority of the research going out to historical societies and digging through archives. The second variety is environmental layers, which includes all of the kind of natural environments, uh, geology, vegetation, hydrography, and things like that across the project area. And the third are basically reference layers to help a user navigate themselves to the project area and either find out where they want to go or where they are when they've pinpointed a specific resource. But two of the reference layers that also overlap the sort of cultural and environmental categories are two base maps that we created for them. We have a LiDAR hillshade covering the entire project area. Uh, it is a deep relief. Next, we have historic mapping as backgrounds. We've got the Trig historical maps that were generated um, using things like the GLO pet maps, which are the next ones up but also including other environmental information for specific areas. You can zoom in, it's still quite sharp. Uh, for instance, we have Hole in the Day's house generally along the Mississippi River. Um, the original Camp Ripley military reservation boundary coming out this way and squishing into Mississippi River again, Port Ripley military roads, all of these things you can see in this trig map. And then we have a different version of historical map being the general land office public survey maps or GLO maps, um, which all come in their own hues. So it looks like a bit of a patchwork. But all of these maps were taken in and georeferenced to their location on the ground, uh, which you'll see actually do line up with township range section. So township boundaries tend to line up with these GLO maps. That's how they were drawn in. And they're the first survey maps of the US for the most part. So a lot of the information that we have for the cultural layer and the environmental layers are pulled from maps like this and like the trig map and elevations like the LIDAR hillshade. So a lot of what you'll see will end up being sort of extrapolated either by us or other entities like MINDA and uh, MNDNR. And so for me personally, a big part of that is I could use this database to highlight all of these natural resources that should be protected. 
as well as using in the environmental data I was able to pull for this database to help highlight potential uh, or high potential areas for archaeological sites that haven't been identified yet. So for instance, if you're looking at, we've got a native plant community, which has been undisturbed, and it's right next to a lake that had produced wild rice, you would think, well, yes, there would be potential for archaeological sites in this area that have not yet been disturbed. Besides that, we have a lot of local historians that have been involved, obviously Jeremy Jackson being the most involved in this project, and this can help them visualize all the research that they do. And I hope it encourages them to learn how to do this on their own. It gives them an understanding of, oh, here's how I can put all of this information that I have learned into a visual format that helps me visually organize everything and see spatial relationships. Like Jeremy Jackson has helped mapped out like the Red River Oxcart Trail. We could overlay that with all the archeological sites that we have mapped in and see, oh, are these sites potentially deposited in association with the trail? Um, are these in association with the pedestrian pathway model that MnDOT has created as part of their predictive model? Uh, it's all good ways to one, test the predictive data that has been created, but also helping just visualize and understand the interconnectedness and the networking of all this information that we have. So overall, I'm gonna drop in everything that was a research for the project area, all the information that was gathered and collected. And that includes up here, we got recorded archeological sites. Let me actually drop this on top of the satellite for you. So you have that reference material, archeological sites, historic districts, historic standing structures, historical standing linear features. Uh, this can be rail lines, pathways, and roads. We have uh, resources of cultural potential. So these are the points that dropped in for that. Areas of cultural resource potential, uh, linear features of cultural resource potential. Again, these, are, these would be paths and roadways or um, rail lines that have been pulled up in the past. And so these can overlap in some places because some things have been replaced since. And then we also have traditional cultural properties and tribally informed uh, potential traditional cultural properties that have been provided to us via information and communication with tribes. And we also have an unrecorded burial sites layer. There's only two of these. Um, and then it moves on into more modeling information that was provided by MnDOT. So what we're looking at in front of us, I'm going to get you some tallies. For all of the information you're looking at in here that was researched and gathered and dropped in, there are 1,749 features in total that you're looking at. And that breaks down to 369 archeological sites as of when we recorded this, that might be updated before this is finally submitted. Um, that's topped off with 1,165 historic structures and 249 points and areas and lines of cultural resource potential. The blue dots, the turquoise areas, and the orange lines are all things that had not yet been previously recorded. So these all represent areas of potential information that haven't been investigated yet. These are pulled from uh, archives at these circle societies, uh, county level, local level, as well as um, like the Doug Burke collection at St. Cloud State University. And so our researchers were able to help pull Burke's research out of the archive and drop it into something that helps network it all together and pull it all into one space and organize all of those maps and photographs and articles to different points on the landscape. So all of that information, you just basically click on the point, this box pops up, all of that text is in front of you, the links are in front of you, and you can click on links or a thumbnail to get the extra attachments. The first part of the pop-up is just text that I've input. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be, you know, general descriptions, like there's a description field for a few sentences that describes a thing. Uh, it will tell you the cultural period, whether it's like pre-contact, contact, post-contact, post -contact, um, cultural affiliations, cultural functions, and all those things are part of the queryable function I talked about earlier with the standardized language. Um, it'll give you, like if it's a structural file, it'll tell you the SHPO inventory number, any associated reports, um, if it's an archaeological file, it'll tell you, yeah, the names of the most recent survey, when the most recent survey was completed, and any additional bibliographic resources you can follow up on if you want to. So that text information is the first part. And um, the second part of that is all of those attachments you were bringing up of like the photographs. Um, all of the archaeological site files are attached to every individual archaeological site. Mm -hmm. All of the SHPO inventory forms are attached to every single structure that has one. If it's a National Register listed property, there's a link to the National Register 
web page for that property. Yeah, all of it's very interactive and it's very comprehensive. Um, as far as uniqueness, it's unique in the way that we included cultural resource potential sites, because it's not usually something that people will go through that amount of research to find things that have not yet been found mm -hmm. and say, yep, this, there's likely there's something here. If you want to know, you're going to have to survey it or something like that. Most things have not done that yet. This project helped people to realize that the land has many layers to it. And when you overlay them all together, you can see the whole picture. And that's one of the big benefits of having a geodatabase. So being able to kind of put a spatial uh, relationship to, to data that was in a file, in a box somewhere, um, was, was a great moment. And to see the potential of how we could use this report and use this, this GIS mapping to kind of action our strategy of protecting those sites. That was a great moment. I would, I would say equal to that was that Archaeology Day. Um, that Archaeology Day was actually born of another Minnesota Historical Society grant with the City of Pillager and Great River Greening. <laughs> We had the opportunity to go up to Camp Ripley to an open house and uh, just put some maps on a table for any person to come, to come and talk to us. At this uh, open house, we were able to talk to two other groups, specifically Great River Greening and the Mississippi Headwaters uh, Board. Uh, and both of them immediately saw not only in the value in the work that we do, but just in gathering together this information and knowledge and sharing it with other people. So um, a couple weeks later, uh, after this open house, we did a one-day project inside of the Sentinel landscape with Great River Greening. They have an opportunity where they were working with the city of Pillager to um, do some environmental cleanup on some property and getting rid of invasive species and, and things like that. Um, we had the opportunity to do some public archaeology with them. And what was really interesting about that day is yes, we had just volunteers that were interested in public archaeology. We had professional archaeologists that were along from Nino Cultural Consultants. But then we had a whole series of interviews that we were doing as part of the Camp Ripley project. Uh, so we had those lifelong historians, avocational archaeologists, those people were there, and then members of just the Great River Greening team, all together in one place. And um, wouldn't you know it, we started immediately finding archaeology. And uh, there were a couple members of the Sylvan Township Board that were present. And they were the ones that took a huge leap of faith on this project. The Camp Ripley Advisory Board had been looking for someone to step up to the plate. No Sentinel landscape had ever done a project like this. They've been heavily focused on environmental aspects of the, the donut of, of data and land around these military bases. But no one had really taken that, that step to say, let's look at the cultural landscape along with the environmental landscape. And Sylvan Township stepped forward and said they'd do it. On that day, uh, when they were able to go out into the field, see an historic landscape with a prehistoric component underneath it, actually hold in their hands pieces of Native American lithic debris, a projectile point, it all came together. So suddenly you had school teachers from Pillager, Sylvan Township board members, lifelong avocationalists and historians all in one place, all realizing that they were all there for one reason on that landscape. We had layered together all these identities into one place, and that's exactly what geodatabases do. So for me, it was the perfect metaphor that, that one day. Mm -hmm.